Some while ago I made a video about platoons, and if you want to see that video you can click in this square here and then you can catch up. But she, a lot of people asked me would I make a video about the next size of unit up, which is the company, and yes I shall, this is that video. So I argued in my platoons video uh, that the platoon is a natural size of unit. It's to do with the number of men that one man can command in detail, actually physically seeing where they all are, keeping them all within shouting range and so forth. Um, and I'm going to be arguing that the company is also a natural size of unit, and it's more to do with the number of men that one man can get to know. You see, there is a, a limit to the number of people that we can get to know and keep track of. There aren't that many people that you could borrow something off. Um, it's very unlikely that there are more than 150 names in your address book, for example. Um, if you lend someone something, you've got to remember that you've done that, and you've got to have established a relationship with that person, so there's that level of trust, and there's got to be a reasonable chance of your meeting them again in the predictable future, so that you can get that thing back. Um, the number of people that you would lend something to happily is very unlikely to be over 150. If you plot uh, on a graph uh, the size of the neocortex, that's the part of the brain which tracks social relationships, uh, with the size of group that an animal lives in, you will find that animals with large neocortexes live in larger groups. It's necessary, of course, because they have to track all those relationships. And if you um, use that to predict how many a human would know, it's about, yep, you guessed it, 150. And the company almost never goes beyond 150. It's usually a fair bit uh, lower than that. There might be, say, 100 men in a company. Um, now, uh, I'm going to show you a British army. It's going to be a parachute uh, unit, because why not? I've painted the figures, uh, from World War II to illustrate a company. Um, though almost everything I'm going to say could apply to companies from all different nationalities and almost all of the modern period, let's say 20th century and, and, and later. Now, just very quickly, let us remind ourselves of what constitutes a platoon. Um, a platoon is made up of sections. You have three sections, and each section is commanded by a corporal and has a rifle group and has, uh, in the case of a World War II section, a, a gun group, uh, one armed with, uh, in the British Army, a Bren gun. So that's a section, and there might be, say, eight men in a section. I've only got seven in these sections, but uh, I didn't want to have to paint more figures than was absolutely necessary. Um, and then you also have a headquarters section, and uh, you have the platoon commander, who is, uh, might be a captain, but he's far more likely to be a, a lieutenant. And then you have his sergeant, his runner, and his batman, who are assisting him. And then you have the platoon uh, support weapons, which uh, has there's the anti-tank capability, capability, which in the case of uh, a British platoon was in the late war, the Piat. And uh, you also, in a British platoon, had a two-inch mortar. So that is one platoon. Um, something in the region of 30 to 35 men, or something like that. And in a company, you have three platoons. Not necessarily three. Uh, there might be four, or there might be two. But I'm going to go with three, which is the commonest number. And um, there is a rule of thumb, I've noticed, that the more elite a unit, the uh, smaller the number of, of parts. So, for instance, uh, commandos might have just two sections to a platoon, and maybe just two platoons to a company, and uh, less elite uh, units might have four of everything. But anyway, we're going to go with three, because it's the commonest number. Um, now, who would command all this? Well, you would have a, uh, a major, typically, would be commanding this if he's in the British Army, and a major would have a crown uh, uh, on his uh, epaulette. And with the major would be uh, the company sergeant major, uh, perhaps, or he might be with the deputy commander of the company. So there are two commanders for a company, typically. The commander, who's usually a colonel, and the deputy commander, who's usually a captain. And in the British Army in World War II, it would be with the deputy commander that uh, th there would be an accompanying radio team. Um, now, that's one big difference between World War II and the modern armies of the world. Uh, in World War II, typically, uh, the first radios appear at company level, and a company would have perhaps just one radio. Uh, modern armies have far better radios and far more of them. Uh, but anyway, World War II, 
that's the guy, deputy commander, and he would stay typically a little bit back from the front, and he's with the radio team. He's trying to keep communications with other companies and with battalion, or even further up. So you don't want him right in the thick of it, because it, you know, he has to operate the radio and try to coordinate with other teams. But should the, uh, the major, it's normally a major, in command of the, the whole company, if he should uh, go down, then it would be the deputy commander who would have to step up. Uh, the company sergeant major would be with one of these two officers. Uh, so each of them has a team of perhaps three or four men to assist uh, actors, runners and so forth. Now, the company commander is the most senior commander in the army who is expected to get stuck in, put himself in danger. He's expected to get forward and get his head into a position so he can see the enemy, see what needs to be done, and then uh, give orders to his platoon commanders to get on with the job of doing whatever it was that needs doing. He, the major commanding the company, would not decide where every last man goes. No, no, no. The platoon commanders, uh, they decide where their sections go. And within the sections, the section commanders decide where individual guys actually put themselves. Um, so the orders from a major would just usually be to uh, the platoon commanders. And then they are trained men there to get on with the job. Now, this distinction of whether you're a fighting soldier or not is quite an important one. And a good example is Herbert Jones, who became a lieutenant colonel in the Paras. And in 1982, in the Falklands, uh, he charged a machine gun nest. And uh, yes, he, you know, the battle was a success. They did take out the machine gun nest. Well done. But in the process, he was killed. And a lot of people were rather critical of this because he's the battalion commander He's not supposed to be putting himself in harm's way like that. He's not meant to be charging machine gun nests. He's supposed to be coordinating the companies under his command, and they're supposed to be putting themselves in danger and getting forward. Um, now, actually, there was a, yeah, there were some people arguing that he should have been perhaps even posthumously court-martialed for what he did, but actually uh, they decided to give him the Victoria Cross instead. So he won the Victoria Cross. And it's interesting. I saw an interview uh, with a lot of troopers who were in his battalion, and the way they reacted to the, the news that he had been killed was rather interesting because they heard that the battalion commander had been killed and they thought, oh, right. Anyway, there's a job to be done. Bullets were flying around. They, they, uh, they could see the enemy. They were stuck in and there was a military situation that they were in and that was what was worrying them. And they all said, these interviewees, these ordinary troopers, that if their company commander had been killed, that would really have worried them because he was the guy who was running the show. He was the guy they could see at the front actually coordinating the platoons to do their job and win the battle. The battalion commander was usually out of sight somewhere dealing with other things and, and, and liaising with even more um, senior commanders higher up the chain. He's usually out of sight, out of mind. Your company commander, he's forward, he's with you, he's giving you orders and he's putting himself in danger, sharing danger with you. Now, those of you who have seen uh, Easy Company's adventures in Band of Brothers will know that it's about the company. The men of Easy Company, they feel that they served with Easy Company. Um, and they probably didn't know many of the men from other companies. If you're in a company, the chances are that you will get to know all the other men in your company. And you'll get to know your officer and he will get to know you. And that's... One of the reasons that the company is a natural size of unit. The company commander, the major, is quite likely to know the names of all the men under his command. I don't know, all of them. He's quite likely to get to know all of them under his command. A bit like a school teacher gets to know uh, all the pupils in that school teacher's own classes. A company commander can know his men. Uh, can know a bit about them as well, not just their names, but uh, what skills they have, a bit about perhaps about their family background. He keeps track of them. And this means that in the field, when the bullets are flying around, he can run up to anyone in his, in his company, immediately recognise him, shout at him, call him by his name, give him an order and expect it to be carried out. Because that trooper looking up will see his officer immediately recognise him, recognise his voice and think, oh, I've been given an order, fair enough, I'll just carry it out. But what if someone else ran over, some other battalion commander or, or division commander, and uh, gave an order? Who is this guy? I've never met him. I don't know his voice. I don't know his name. Can I trust him? Within the company, a company commander can just give orders vocally. He can just say to his platoon commander, do this. The platoon commander can say, right, 
sergeant, do that, and it go down the line, all without any need for written orders. But above company level, you need to get formal. You need to start having things like signed written orders because you may be, be given an order by someone you don't know and don't necessarily trust, but you know he's given the right codes and so forth. All right, yes, I've been given the orders. I accept this as authentic. But some bloke that you don't know shouting an order at you in the middle of a battle, who the hell's he? Does he have my best interests at heart? I don't know. I'm, I'm serving with my men. I will share the danger with my men. I will do things to keep my men safe because they're my guys. They're in my company. That's how the men of Easy Company felt about each other. And that's how those troopers uh, in Goose Green in 1982, they felt about their, the, the members of their company. This is our company. I will do stuff in order to, to, to further the interests of my company. And if some other guy asks me to do something for someone else, uh, uh, why they, they can look after themselves. I'm, I'm looking after my company. You have to give me written orders because I don't know who you are and I don't really feel that I'm working for you. So the company is a natural size of unit. It's made up of platoons. Um, it may have things attached to it. For instance, here th this is just an infantry company. It could be that during a battle, there would be uh, some uh, mortars, uh, medium mortars, or some medium machine guns uh, from some other unit attached to this to help support it. But the basic infantry unit is platoons commanded by a major with a captain as his deputy. Ladies and gentlemen, the company. <laughs>